Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions. Today I bring in Yolana Nahanovic. Did I get that right? You did. Thank you. As, as usual, it normally takes a few practice runs. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yourself? Yep, all good. So, do you want to give you, this is your first time on the show. Do you want to, I know of you very much so. I've seen your videos, etc. Excited to have you on the show. But do you want to give the audience a bit of background on yourself? Of course. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and share some of the examples and uh, from our experience in the past months on Amazon. Um, I'm Yelena. I manage a digital marketing agency that's focused on full service Amazon marketing. And um, we are based in Serbia and this team has existed for the past two years. Um, before that, I was managing accounts on Google ads and Facebook ads, mostly managing PPC budgets uh, across the, those two main platforms. So recently we started shifting our focus from individual e-commerce websites to working on marketplace. Sounds good. Yeah. Cool. So you sent me some information over, we were having a chat off call. So there's a load of tips that you want to put through basically a lot of stuff that you do within your business, what you want to share with the, with the audience today. So kicking things off, do you want to talk me through, you've got a process for cheap auto campaigns. Is that right? Yes. Like we discussed a couple of minutes ago, um, I told you that there was this like, um, a couple of layers of campaigns so we we were able to um, kind of like transfer uh, some partial one part of the mindset from google ads over to amazon advertising because you know the the targeting options and uh, especially keyword targeting are pretty similar uh to what we had for years on google adwords so we were able to transfer over that experience and see what kind of structuring um changes we might be able to apply to campaign types that we currently have on Amazon. And like one of those is layering your campaigns according to, um, and, and your bids as well, according to the, you know, the importance of the products that you sell. Uh, for example, if you have like one flagship product that is your main generator of cash flow, and you know that you have to uh, add, it, add a lot of daily budget to it, then you will separate it in its own. Uh, automated campaign but there's this like layer of um, products like for example if you have huge portfolio if you have tons of variations especially in the in the apparel category then uh, what you want to do is create this one specific very very cheap campaign that will have its own really big budget like we're talking about let's say 200 300 dollars per day but have multiple hundreds and thousands of products in it all in all grouped in one app group and something like very, very low bids, like five cents bids. And this um, is something that we usually uh, run over a very long course of time. This is a campaign that's like a foundational campaign that we, uh, it has multiple purposes. Its main purpose is to be very cheap in terms of uh, advertising cost of sales. So this is something that um, usually our methodology around this is to analyze the performance of these products and see which ones are the main spenders. Like you probably know from the Pareto principle, 80% of impact is going to come from 20% of uh, whatever, 20% of some items. Like for example, 80% of sales will come from 20% of your products. So what you wanna do is cut the spend from those 20% that are just really harming the, the whole campaign and uh, let the, the others run at five, five cents or maybe even 10 cents. So what you will achieve most, most likely is that Amazon will pick up this campaign. The algorithm will learn about it. The more it learns, the, the more effectively it can serve your ads uh, on all placements and all other, uh, uh, throughout all times of the day. Right now, if there is no, day parting uh, feature on Amazon, as far as I know. So we don't have the ability to like isolate certain hours throughout the night where we will specifically show these ads. But this is what actually happens through this automated cheap campaign that actually serves your ads. Whenever you can slip it, like when, when there's a certain uh, time throughout the night where there isn't a lot of competition and no one is or you know competitors already budget budgets are already depleted that day. Yeah. Uh, that's where your products really kick in 
at a very low price because you're not allowing it to be yeah. high. Yeah. This so, has to follow through fixed uh, bit. Uh, cool. So what I'm extracting for a couple of things that I want to cover here. So point one is by loading the campaigns up with a huge amount of catalog in there. What we're doing is we're forcing the algorithm to work to spend some money somewhere, right? So that's part one. Perfect. And part two, because of where people run out of budgets, and again, you've got this huge campaign again, in the dead of night, you can get lucky and where there's not going into the auction, the run out of budgets, etc you've got the opportunity to appear again and gain clicks and sales through there. But basically we're using the Pareto's law of the 80, 20 rule because basically by you, that sheer volume, it's like lucky dip to see what drops out at the bottom. Yes. And that's worked out really well for us, especially for the brands that have huge portfolio. That's like a, one of those campaigns where you are digging out for profitability and yeah. just works for sponsored products, yeah. campaign types. Sounds good. Uh, auto campaign structuring is another thing you wanted to bring to light. Yeah, yeah. I shared when we shared some ideas what we could talk about today. Um, yep. One of those ideas was uh, the automated campaign structuring. Again, you know, uh, having these, uh, like for example, in Google Ads, you have this editor app that allows you to do on a large scale huge changes and huge accounts. And you don't have this in Amazon uh, advertising platform, Campaign. aside from, you know, bog files, but that's, that, that has nothing to do with the campaign structure again. Yeah. So um, the campaign structure is one of the main opportunities that we use to, you know, generate uh, competitive advantage for, for our competitors. Like, for example, if you have clarity, like in, in general in business, when you have clarity around where your money is going, um, that's when you can actually make informed decisions and make the right decisions. So when it comes to structuring your automated campaigns, it's the same principle, just being narrowed down to a one campaign level. Basically, one simple thing, uh, using a very simple ad group structure uh, where you would place one targeting group per ad group, one targeting group, so basically four ad groups per automated campaign, where you would have one for substitutes, complements, close match, and loose match. And uh, why is this super important? Because once you, you know the month has passed and you have collected all the information, you will have it downloaded to a CSV file and you will look through it just so that you'll be able to analyze it. And if you have it sorted down through ad groups, Basically, you will see exactly which kind of searches, profitable or unprofitable, are coming from which uh, targeting group, so that you know exactly which targeting group is working for that specific product. And most of the cases, if you know your niche very, very well, or if you, you know, dedicated tons of time into product development and made brought this product to another level, then you will, with high likelihood, already know what kind of targeting group will work for that product. But some of the sellers don't know this, and this hack that we use has really been helpful to us to get gain that clarity and cut costs. Makes sense. Um, video for ads for mobile. This has uh, been a hot topic recently. We just uh, had Brent Zaradnik on covering part of this, but you've mm -hmm. got, uh, it's, well, not maybe a theory, but you, we're looking at a land grab here. Do you want to explain about limited ad placements and your theory behind that? Um, yes, we don't have a lot of samples on video ads because uh, not a lot of our clients have the eligibility to do this, but um, this is more like a high level talk about this when we spoke about this. Well, basically, you know, same as with some of the features that, um, became pretty scarce on Google ads, for example. Again, um, uh, transferring that mindset over to Amazon advertising, we can practically predict that there's not going to be a lot of uh, placements on Amazon that are you know, available for video ads, especially because they're limited to mobile devices and especially because you know, putting too much of them will really, really harm user experience and then they will bounce off of uh, Amazon, like Amazon.com is a website. I mean, it's an e-commerce platform, but what they do care about is lowering their bounce rates as much as possible because, mm. because again, that harms their rating on Google yeah. as a, yeah. as a way. It's their rankings and stuff because uh, of the bounce rate, yeah. 
exactly. So uh, it's only a matter of time where they will start limiting these placements for video ads, but like, you know, like they, like they limited audience targeting. They uh, have audience targeting available just for brands that invest more than $35,000 per month. And this is um, probably due to their lack of bandwidth right now, because it's a different type of problem. But when it comes to placements and such, uh, then this uh, comes down to narrowing down uh, the availability of these features to advertisers just because they want to preserve their user experience. But when it comes to audience targeting, I think it's only a matter of time when they will roll this out probably this year um, to make sure that you can more effectively target your customers uh, through audience targeting as well. Sounds good. And moving on, there's a couple of things here in terms of brand analytics using item comparison and the demographics. So do you want to kick off with the comparison first? Uh -huh, of course. Um, well, basically, um, my uh, one of our uh, latest focuses for the past couple of months, we have been working a lot for female brands and uh, that, that target female millennials specifically. So we really focused on getting uh, advertising for them really effective. And some of our most interesting finds was that you can find a lot of golden nuggets and brand analytics reports, uh, specifically, you know, item comparison reports. Um, if you have an existing brand that has an established portfolio and that's worked out really well, for you and you want to launch this additional new product this item comparison report will let you know you know what else your uh, customers are considering when they are browsing through amazon when they're making a purchasing decision so whichever products are in the top two or three places next to yours is something to consider to add to your product portfolio yeah. but again when you already have uh, you know, this product, you know, for example, that, you know, whoever's watching, um, whoever's looking for a shampoo, they're also considering a conditioner, for example. Yeah. So if you already have that conditioner and you can see that your competitor's conditioner is in that item comparisons list in the top three places, then definitely you should consider adding that to your sponsor brand's ads to make sure that you showcase first that this uh, kind of product is also in your arsenal so that you can utilize it for upsell potential. And at the same time, make sure to follow that through uh, self-targeting on product targeting, meaning you want to make sure to add that conditioner in uh, product targeting for your own uh, brand, meaning that once someone clicks on that sponsored brands uh, ad, for example, and lands on a product detail page, that they again see your ad in the product detail page next to your organic results, because that's super important for, uh, you know, ensuring there's consistent consistency and the funnel like presence on Amazon, which yeah. they are, they're deliberately giving you options for, yeah. you know, yeah. all of these uh, display ads, sponsor brands, ads, uh, even retargeting is something that uh, a clear message from Amazon that they want us to create the funnel like presence on Amazon because more and more people are spending time there. And um, obviously there's opportunity. Yep, <clears throat> makes sense. And then moving on to demographic data. Yes, um, for demographic data, like for example, you know, some of the basics you can read from there, like marital sta status and who is, um, uh, what is the gender and what's the household, household income. income. Yeah, Stuff like that is exactly, super important. Yeah. Yep. Well, for now, we usually use um, demographic reports to make sure that we really understand who we are selling to, because some cases we have a wrong presumption of uh, who the customers are. And then you read the report and see that there's someone else also considering that product. So uh, when you have this information, usually populates best with brand brands that, uh, aside from that, have a lot of traffic. Um, then, you know, you can learn how to custom tailor your message. Um, also, when I, when I say copywriting, I mean also the, the paid uh, stuff, but also the, the product detail page. So basically, if you're selling to women, uh, I recently wrote, a, wrote like a blog post about it. Um, you know that if, if you're 
customers are 80% women, you know, you should custom tailor your sponsor brands ads, um, make it uh, enrich it with imagery for mobile devices, uh, which is one of their newest features recently. And also, you know, make your product detail pages emotionally charged if possible, or, you know, uh, utilize this information to build a kick-ass customer support team that will pay attention to the customers and create a dialogue with them, which is one of the main ways how direct-to-consumers brand will survive in this year. Yeah. So. Yep, makes sense. And a couple on CTRs. So let's start with the sponsored brands ads using keywords, a bit like Google. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, well, again, uh, mindset from Google ads, and I'm starting to <laughs> repeat myself on that, but it's just, it's working right now. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, um, you know, what you want to do when you use sponsor brands ads, you want to use this uh, opportunity to write a custom message in it, which is uh, basically, uh, if you have, there are multiple ways, uh, creative ways that brands are using to target customers through sponsor brands ads, depending on what your goals are, obviously. Yeah. So some of them will target generic keywords, like for example, not unrelated to your brand because you want to generate new to brand customers and you want to target specifically uh, these generic keywords, for example, I don't know, ashwagandha supplement. Mm -hmm. So make sure to mention that keyword in your sponsor brands ad copy because this is proven to generate the highest click through rates. If you double down on the placements as well by, uh, you know, decreasing uh, maximally your bits on all placements that are not top of the uh, search page, then the, the probability of increasing your click through rates is so much higher. Yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. Because, you know, people are much more likely to um, click on something that they already know, that's familiar to them. That's how we are wired, that's how brains work. So if you, uh, you know, write this keyword in the copy of the ad, you're much more likely to get that additional click from them, especially on that premium placement that sponsor brands ads offer. So this is one of the tips that I had for click to rate optimization, and it's super important um, also along with conversion rate. I think that those two metrics are the most important yeah. because, mm -hmm. um, you know, even though Amazon doesn't explicitly say so, but they do have quality scores assigned to campaigns. Yeah. And mm -hmm. this is one of the ways to hack that quality score and uh, generate higher ranking for your products um, through paid results. Yeah, <clears throat> makes sense. And improvements of uh, products with like in terms of click through rate for multi variations. Now, I think you've gone the route of best selling variation. So go into that. But then could you let me know what you would do if you don't have any data that you're launching a new SKU? What do you do there as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, basically, it's looking at click through rates from different views. Like yep. when I mentioned, you know, updating your ad copy to fit the narrative, it's one of the psychological ways of improving click through rates. But when it comes to using advertising different variations to improve click through rates, it's more of a technical way that you, um, through numbers, uh, are able to achieve that kind of improvement. So for example, if you have a brand that has 10 different colors of leggings that they sell, um, one of them being red, that's their best seller. That's the one you should advertise for, uh, not the rest of them, because that's the one that will generate your highest click through rates and the highest indication of, it has already highest indication of interest. So that's the one that you will double down on, like everything else that you have information about. So uh, that being said, when you just make that small change, you are able to improve click through rates without any big additional effort that from your end. So basically, um, this is also important, like I said, for, for the quality of uh, your campaigns that Amazon assigns to advertisers. And um, at the same time, if you don't have an information about what you should do, what you should do if you don't have an information about uh, uh, these additional, these all these variations, if it's a completely new portfolio, I would just advertise them all at the same time. And yeah. that way, but you will have to have a clear structure. So if this is an, you know, automated campaign 
and you have you have like 10 different variations then each one will have to have a you don't necessarily have to split them through ad groups because you will still see each individual variations statistics, but you would have to run it for at least, let's say a month or so, depending on how quickly you can populate that data um, mm -hmm. to, to make that informed decision, which one will be your best selling variant. But yeah. generally speaking, not a lot of sellers will launch 10, 20 variants at a time unless they have a lot of capital to begin with. Makes sense. So it all depends <coughs> on the situation. Cool. What about display retargeting? Yeah, I mentioned that um, there is also some kind of display retargeting uh, tips that I would like to share with you. And basically, you know, when it comes to display retargeting, right now the settings are choosing which products you want to advertise for and eligibility of the products is still a little bit limited for certain reason, probably because their partnership network is again limited. Uh, but when it comes to display retargeting, this is a very good way for you to gain competitive advantage on these unconventional placements. What I mean by that, you should separate, of course, you have the ability to separate, uh, to retarget the customers who already saw your products and at the same time, separate them from those who saw similar products, which are basically competitors' products. So uh, if you want to do competitive targeting through this way ads, then make sure to only target the ones that uh, the people who saw similar products, because um, Amazon is not just the purchasing platform for products, like you already know, it's a, they have a huge amount of services offered and digital products and it's a, it's like a universe of things they're they're in war with everyone in terms of you know generating popularity getting getting yeah. this popularity so uh, they have this they bought tons of websites that they now own that yeah. are practically present their affiliate network for all mm. kinds of Ads. And for and tracking as well, they own uh, Alexia. Is it Alexia.com, yeah. which is the world's largest site that tracks the data for that everyone's was a site? Huge acquisition, huge acquisition. Yeah. And yeah. not to mention that they, you know, also own Amazon Web Services, which is mm. like, I don't know. AWS, which is host the internet, doesn't it? Most of yes. They have all the possible information you can or can't imagine about people, about, you know, customers. So, uh, I would leverage that. I would definitely leverage that and make sure I'm present on those partnership uh, or the whole partnership network mm. of all those websites that they own because it's it's not a strategy that a lot of competitors think of or make sure or, or they think that it has any value, but I think it does. Yeah. And going back to the other website as well, with, um, with Amazon owning that information and that data, it goes back to, you know, when they do uh, competitive analysis on pricing. Now, if they've got access to the data of everyone on the web, you know, there are going to be ways where they can mine that data to keep an eye on what's going on out there. So definitely, definitely a, a clever move. So uh, here's one. This is the final one coming from you, which is sponsored brand ads, mentioning coupon codes. Talk to me about that. Yes, yes. One of the hacks we used for uh, specifically for a women apparel brand. Mm -hmm. um, this was a brand that already had uh, a present portfolio established of good selling products and they wanted to launch two different new variants and they were brand registered. So we were thinking, okay, what can make a slight advantage for them in a, such a competitive niche such as apparel? So. Basically, what we did is in the copywriting, in the, you know, the ad copy of the sponsor brand's ads, we mentioned that there is a coupon code for these products that we are advertising for. Mm -hmm. And this is a cool hack that can help you further increase your click rates and generate a lot more sales, not a lot more sales, but the ones that are value driven. Like, for example, if you know that someone is prone to uh, purchasing, to making a purchasing decision easier, if you can get them a better price, then this is the, the kind of, you know, strategy to use, especially working really, really well with baby boomers that are value shoppers mostly. So if you have a brand that, you know, people who are 50 plus are purchasing, then this is an interesting thing to try. 
because mm -hmm. you the, they will perceive it as an added value of your product which always goes well in advertising yeah, yeah. that makes total sense Right, so you gave 10 great tips there. Before we go, do you want to give the audience uh, the way that they can reach you for your agency, et cetera? Uh, yes, they can find me on Facebook and our name is Amazonia PPC. So I'm pretty, we're working hard on getting ranked on Google. So I'm pretty yeah. sure they can find us there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just like on a final note, I just wanted to get your opinion of how do you think this whole, uh, you know, platform is in which direction is it moving like we know that they they have tons of information about customers they know which products are selling at what rates and all of that what the profitability is at scale they have the you know all the, the possible access to suppliers at scale who can produce this at very low prices and we have this huge amount of chinese sellers kicking in and winning at amazon games so um, what do you so think? So which, which one of those do you want me to ask <laughs> to answer? There's about two hours worth of content. So let me go for the first one, right? Articulate. Sure. When you look at Amazon PPC, if you want to see the future, go and look at Google Ads, AdWords, mm -hmm. and go and look at Facebook Ads. That's what Amazon will look like in the future because everyone copies each other and everyone takes a bit, the best bits from each other scaling PPC platforms is very, very hard. And if you'd noticed that Amazon went for years with just basically Fisher Price, wasn't it? It was shit. And in the last couple of years, it's had an, a massive ramp up of offering lots of different services. Now they've put a weight behind growing that business, but they've also introduced us the different types in terms of idiot tax, you know, compliments, etc. So they're getting people to waste money as well. Even though they're shifting towards relevant, they still want morons on the platform to burn cash. So mm -hmm. they're finding ways for you to piss money down the drain is how I see it. But on the flip side, if you've got experienced people, people like to listen to this show, know what they've got, know, know what they're doing when it comes to PPC. So that is not benefiting to them, but the mum and pup stores out there, that's where Amazon's going to make a lot of their money because there is, it's like, um, I'll call it from an old school term is dark patterns. Do you remember, I don't know if they still do it today because I don't, I use AdWords, but I can't remember the, if the setting's still there. But do you remember it was always the default selected for the display network, even though when you're setting up a PPC campaign, yeah. you're like, shit, where do I burn all that money from? Yeah. So I think Amazon had gone that way on mm -hmm. one side. I think if you want to look to the future of Amazon, uh, then you look at these platforms because they'll take the best of those when they can reach that because, as I said, scaling PPC platforms is, is very, very hard to do. And I think Amazon's just worked it out now. And that's why in the last couple of years, you've seen a suite of products. Yeah. The other question you were talking about is the, the mining of all the data that they've got. Well, you've got the anti-complete, the uh, anti-compete, not complete, sorry. You've got the anti-compete. So I think um, Amazon could be broken up in a few years' time. They'll fight it, but that could mm -hmm. be a stage where some of these businesses are sp spun off. We'll see. We see it happen with Google. They're up there with being one of the most powerful companies in the world, so why not? There'll be an antitrust uh, thing that will be into play. It's just going to be taken. How long is it going to take to get through the courts? I think with, with the Chinese, you can't just put a broad brush on it. There's, mm -hmm. there's like a couple of dozen, if not a few more, black hat, real hit, mm -hmm. hardcore black hat uh, sellers that do most of the black hat stuff. But if you go to China, they're not all that way if you spent time in China. Um, so there is a chunk on the platform that does a bulk like the 80-20, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that is, you would say, from China, they're doing black hat. Um, but I don't think that's going to be such a problem in the future as they introduce new things. But obviously, if people want to cheat, they'll find new ways of cheating. I think the bit, I think what they're going to struggle with is that they want, they want the Chinese for that tremendous scale. They want to go direct to factory. They want to be the everything store, but yeah. I don't think they're clearly know how to handle the black hat bit. And with that, I think what they do is they do turn a bit of a blind eye to some they of do. them. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. You know, so I don't, th I think what we need to do as, as sellers is worry about our own business. If we're in the business of going, I'm going to blame everything on everyone else, then you might as well give up tomorrow because that's a cop out. 
right? What you've got to do is, is you've got to look at selling products that the Chinese are not going to sell a lot cheaper than you. It's just they've got a competitive advantage, right? You've got to build your brand story. You go and manufacture locally or you take a products that are a pain in the ass or oversized stuff, stuff that is not going to be of interest to people looking to pick the lowest hanging fruit. Does that make sense? So I think we, we have our jobs. It's, it's only going to get tougher to sell on Amazon and it's, it's, uh, it's going to be the survival of the fittest, basically. Can't stick a badge on stuff anymore and get away with it and stick it in a poly bag. Doesn't wash. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's about that's real business, real products. And that's what we do on the podcast. This is a, uh, we communicate to those real businesses out there building real teams and building real products for the future. I agree, especially because like, for example, the upcoming generations of customers or millennials mostly yeah. are definitely sensitive to things like you just mentioned, poly bags, uh, you know, eco-friendly products. I'm the yeah. one who's using a lot of eco-friendly cosmetics because uh, this level of awareness is a little bit higher. People are getting more and more informed. They have all this information available and what they want is a dialogue with the mm. brand. Yeah. If you don't, if you can't support them post purchase, then that's where it all is for brands. So yeah. that's one of the ways of how you can actually survive this major shift that's going on on Amazon. And at the same time, you know, add all these things that can uh, contribute to an added value of the products, whether that would be like an ebook or whether that would be freebies inside of product packaging that not necessarily are the cards that tell. Give yeah. us a five star rating, you know, stuff like that. But more like, you know, some posters or maybe small, small notebooks, pens, and everything that's branded. It doesn't necessarily have to cost you a lot per, per unit, but will uh, be used for another certain period of time by them, which will make uh, make it stick, make your name stick in their heads for a little longer. So. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you can then establish communication with them off Amazon and mm. gain that control. Amazon yeah. is still a very good channel for, you know, solving all of these logistical issues that a lot of e-commerce businesses are facing and were facing in the years when uh, such a streamlined process such as FBA never yeah. even existed before. So uh, one portion of it will be still useful for the brands, but the other one will be, you know, paying attention to, speaking to your customers directly and hearing them out. Yeah, indeed. All right, so let's wrap that there. Um, I understand you're, you're flying in. You're going to come over to Seller Sessions May 9th as well, right? Absolutely. One we'll message for the world. Sounds good. Cool. Guys, if you want to grab tickets, you can go and grab them in the link below. If this is your first time, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you again in the next few days. Take care.